Uh, my name is Derek Chin. I'm a strategy consultant and industry analyst to the legal profession. This is the panel for artificial intelligence and legal analytics, what's all the fuss about. Uh, we will be exploring in greater detail in this session uh, topical themes around predictive analytics, data analytics, bias of data analytics, uh, ethics, artificial intelligence, and predictions for the future. As an industry analyst looking at the development of uh, data analytics in the legal profession, it's been pretty interesting. I mean, what is legal analytics? So legal analytics is essentially a process of extracting uh, information from complex data uh, to inform lawyers on, on strategic actions. And the complex data comes in the form of parameters of a case, uh, presiding judges past judgments, and also the opposing counsel's past performance and the client's track record. It is about helping smart lawyers become better at uh, what they do by making strategic data-driven decisions. In other words, we're seeing uh, the legal profession transitioning from uh, an opinion-driven to a data-driven profession. So to explore this further, we have four really distinguished panelists with me here today. Uh, what I'll do in just a moment is to get them to introduce themselves and their thoughts on the topic. Uh, but it is with great pleasure I'd like to welcome Jody Baker, who is the Managing Director at Zaga Technologies and Co-Chair of the Center for Legal Innovation. And next to Jody is Matthew Golab, who is Head of Legal Informatics at Gilbert and Tobin. And next to Matthew is Ian Oberman, who is the Chief Data Scientist and CEO at the New South Wales Data Analytics Center. And finally, we have Joe Waite, who is the Executive Manager uh, of Product and Platform for Legal and Professional for LexisNexis. So my name is Jody Baker. I am the founder and CEO of Zaki Technologies, which is a legal um, in-house matter management system. So it's used by uh, many corporates, uh, including um, let me see, uh, Virgin Australia, I've got to think about the ones who've given me the okay to, to name them, Boral, Transurban, uh, a whole bunch of corporates. About 62, 63 corporates globally use our software, it's about 18 months old, uh, and it's used to track uh, the work that's been done by an in-house legal team, and from that you gather all sorts of very interesting data, and that data is then used to identify trends and, uh, and find ways to improve efficiencies within the system. Um, one of my other hats is to be the co-chair of the advisory board for the Centre for Legal Innovation uh, and also one of the founding members and the deputy president of the Australian Legal Technology Association. Hi, my name is Matthew Golab. I'm head of legal informatics at Kilburn and Um I've been in law firms the last 20 years and legal industry for uh, a bit longer since I started for uh, so I originally came from a library background, and, um, uh, which was then the law libraries, and that's given me uh, complementary skills for data analytics and databases and stuff, particularly because you're trying to classify in topic and ontologies and all kinds of So um, my focus on the last 20 years has been large-scale document review or e-discovery, but I call it large-scale document review for commercial litigation, responding to regulators, royal commissions, and due diligence and M&A. Um, we've been using data analytics in the form of conceptual clustering as well as um, metadata style data analytics for the last um, five years or so. Uh, and then over the past three years, we've had a focus on data analytics within the firm on um, our firm's data. Um, in addition to my role at GNT, I'm involved in an industry group on information governance in ANZ uh, and ethics and AI and ordinary decision. Great, fantastic. Uh, my name is Ian Opperman. I'm the New South Wales Chief Data Scientist. Can I just quickly ask, is there anybody else from New South Wales government in the room? <laughs> fantastic, awesome. Can things get a little, a little rocky? Uh, so, my wife's a barrister, and what I'm experiencing right now is, is that conversation I with my wife about AI and data writ large. So I feel there's many, many more people on the, um, on the other side of that conversation than I normally have around the kitchen table. What I do as a day job is bring data analytics to bear on wicked policy challenges. The Data Analytics Centre just turned three earlier this month. We have 
problems which are endorsed by New South Wales Cabinet, they range from fun stuff like transport optimisation, fire and rescue response times, to domestic and family violence, to compulsory third party insurance reform, to out of home care reform, so the foster care system reform. We work very hard to build high fidelity, high granularity knowledge and understanding of the journey of a child, a family, a household, a building, a property, and really cast a very wide net in terms of the data sets we use to help bring that view of the problem. Data is a way of seeing the world. If you're ambitious about the data sets you bring to bear, you can bring very, very different perspectives on that problem. Science is a way of seeing the world, and the science we use allows us to deliberately recomplicate that complex set of relationships that any person, property, building, fire truck goes through and use analytical techniques, whether they're machine learning or more sophisticated artificial intelligence techniques, to better understand the problem and with as much complexity as we can cope with, to identify factors of risk, and in particular modifiable factors of risk, which allow us to then predict outcomes or think about different sorts of interventions, or do that what if scenario planning, what if we did this, what if we did that, and then ultimately to evaluate the effectiveness of something which is being deployed. Wow. <laughs> uh, my name's Jo Wade. I work at LexisNexis and I'm responsible for our um, legal research platform as well as our, I guess, somewhat fledgling data analytics initiatives and data visualisation um, and other solutions as well. And I feel, I think, first I have about 100 questions for Ian after that. That was amazing. Um, but also, I just wanted to make a few observations. Um, we know that new technology, including data analytics, is having a tremendous impact in our market. And um, these changes are happening with or without our company. So we, I've worked at LexisNexis for a long time, and it can get a bit insular, like your perspective can get a bit inward looking. But we are you know, very much, with, especially with um, disruptive technologies that are emerging at the moment, we're with all these changes happening without us, so we need to participate. Um, and when we talk about disruptive technology, we're really talking about things like cloud, access to cloud computing, and CPUs which, with much greater compute power than previously. Um, so I guess the upshot is many more people could get access to do things that we couldn't do before, like neural networks and machine learning. Um, so it's becoming easier, more ubiquitous. Um, so technology by definition is itself becoming disruptive. Um, another, uh, something that also we're very acutely aware of is data proliferation. So with the explosion of computing power, as well as things like social media and devices and so on, um, we're getting a lot more data thrown at us or available to us that we want to work with. Um, but I do want to contrast that with something that Karen said in the plenary session, which is that in some areas of law we don't have enough <coughs> data to do things like genuinely predictive data analytics, and that's a challenge that we have. So we sort of have this really weird situation where in some ways we're drowning in data and lawyers are drowning in data, data within their firm, from their clients, as well as traditional um, content that maybe you subscribe to or, or get from a government website or something. Um, but at the same time, when we're looking at what can we do with data analytics and how are we classifying and marking up our data and what's available within the data. We just don't have enough yet um, to say, for example, build good training sets for machine learning. Um, so that's, I guess, a, a conundrum that I guess I can talk about a bit more later on. Um, and also, just really quickly, I wanted to mention um, outside work, I have a huge contrast with the data that we work with. Within LexisNexis, we work with traditional, what I call traditional data, which is things like judgments and legislation and authored commentary and things like that. Um, outside work, I, I volunteer for a non-profit where we do digital support for disaster relief and almost exclusively data mining social media data. And the contrast is absolutely incredible. Like, you know, um, new vocabularies and structures being formed by the hour, by groups of people. Um, people attempting to influence those people to create different structures and it changes so quickly, yet within LexisNexis, um, you know, we have a situation where we'd really like to be able to identify something like, um, you know, filing dates or something, and that for us would be a massive step change to be able to identify and enrich our data in a way that we could use that in data analytics, and that one change. Um, so yes, I think I'll leave my comments there. <laughs>
I, I really, really interesting thoughts on, on this topic, but I just want to take a step back and sort of get everyone to share sort of some of the trends that you observe in legal analytics. In other words, what's the current state of the market for legal analytics uh, from the work that you're doing and the client that you're working with? So actually I quite found the comment that Karen made um, also very interesting, Joe. I think that there is a distinction between big data and AI, and you do need a lot of data for AI, and small data. And I think that um, in legal, certainly in the space that I operate in, uh, small data is far more relevant than the big data. So if you're trying to do predictive analytics around um, you know, what a case is going to, how a case is going to be resolved or what a judgment might look like, or if you're uh, building tools like Contract Probe, I see Michael Patterson sitting here, um, and you're, you're doing things like reviewing contracts and um, giving us some uh, feedback or AI feedback about what that contract should include, then yes, you need big sets of data. But the trend that I'm seeing is actually legal departments, and I suspect also law firms, but my, my clients are legal departments, actually just want small data. At the very base level, they just want to know very simple things. What are we doing? Who are we doing it for? How many contracts are we reviewing per year? What is our budget? And it sounds very, very basic, but actually we are now finding tools in the market that will help us to identify that data, help us to distill that data down into a set that we can use and visualise. And that has not been possible for really, well, pr probably forever. And it's even to the next point, and I think that you touched on this too, Joe. cloud computing has made that accessible for everybody. For, at, on a SaaS basis, on a per user basis, it means that tiny teams and tiny firms can access um, that tool set that will allow them to identify what that data is capture that data in a way that is very easy and then visualise that data. So the trends that I see are um, an increase in the capture of the data and the visualisation. The three areas where I see it being used are in resourcing, this is for, for corporate legal teams, resourcing, external resource management, so fee management if you like, and then work selection. <coughs> what is it that we're actually going to do and how we're going to do it? Um, are we going to automate that? Are we going to employ some of the AI tools that are out there? But in terms of the data itself, I actually think that uh, we can get very excited about AI and big data, but the trend that I see on a day-to-day -day basis is actually people starting to identify their own personal or their own small team data. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I have to, um, to touch on your point, um, visualisation and dashboards it is an in interesting trend, I guess, from a operational perspective within organisations. Um, and another one in the industry would be um, some Australian startups and global startups with mining of um, case judgments and case predictions. Um, and for some of the jurisdictions in Australia where the um, court lists and the um, filing information is accessible, then they're starting to do some mining of the life of a case. Um, but particularly those that don't go to judgment. Um, in the US, it, it's a lot bigger where there's it's just a very different scale system, but um, the systems are also a lot more open so they can access a lot more data, therefore they can build um, a lot more predictive analytics, whereas uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, the thing that you touch on, we're limited by our data in Australia. So I've got a slightly different perspective, and like I mentioned before that we are really ambitious about the data sets that we go after. And whilst the class of problem will actually describe for you whether it's a big data problem or a small data problem, I'm just going to touch on two different ends of the spectrum. One of the problems we started looking at was transport optimization. Blue sky question is what do we need to do and build in New South Wales for transport? Proof of concept that we could deliver in a short period of time was why don't people take the train during off-peak times? So we built models of every train station in Sydney, 305 of them, inbound, outbound, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month. We linked in 7,000 bus stops. We connected then using a, a whole lot of open car data, but we also used weather data. Uh, we used car park capacity, bike rack capacity, interchange uh, delay information, uh, pollen count, sunrise, sunset, uh, and a whole range of other event information, built models, predictive models for why people don't take the train. And it turns out that it's um, got a lot to do with the weather, not at all surprisingly. Uh, for every one degree temperature rise on a weekday morning in Parramatta Station, 120 fewer people take the train out of Parramatta. And 
there's a remarkable number of things that you can find when you look through data sets which have the dimensionality which is similar to the dimensionality of the problem. So we all remember simultaneous equations, if you've got three unknowns and you've got three variables. So three variables and three unknowns, you, you can work it out. And if you don't, you can approximate a space. At the other end, we are working with the out-of-home care reform. And it's probably the most sensitive project we've worked on. Uh, we have built child-centric journeys for every one of the children who've been in out-of-home care in New South Wales in the last 15 years. 22,000 children at the moment, cost the state a billion dollars a year. Some of you may know that David Tune did a review in 2016 that said the system needs to change. We developed our first data set based on education, family community services, health and justice. So subsets of data sets out of those agencies, but for every child that's been in the out of home care system. And then wrapped around that, all related persons, 137,000 related persons, 44,000 children over a 10 year period in the out of home care and realized that we could predict things if we changed the problem. But that's a small data problem, believe it or not. 200,000 people is a small data problem because the dimensionality of the challenge we were looking at could we predict what happens to a child doesn't match the dimensionality of the data. And in practice, we're talking about all the different possible decisions and variances that you could consider. A, a human being is probably of the order of 10 to the 100 million in terms of complexity. So we'll never have enough data to actually predict individuals. So we changed the problem and said, let's talk about cohorts of children, for example, children under 12, and look at predicting what happens to cohorts individually, they're hard to predict. Collectively, we're actually not that difficult to predict. And you can start to look at statistically relevant ways of predicting what happens to children based on different decisions as they propagate through the out of home care system. So what we're trying to do is, is take all of New South Wales government on a journey to fundamentally rethink the sort of things, the sort of questions you can ask, the sort of things you can know, but do it in a way which ultimately acknowledges and accepts the limitations of the data, limitations of the techniques and limitations of, of the data quality. But with one other point, so when you're tapping on and tapping off with your Opal card, you're pretty close to actually having real world information about a passenger journey. When you've got information which is recorded by a human being, which is interpreted by someone else, you're actually quite a long way from the real world. Data is a way of seeing the world. It's not the real world, it's a way of seeing it. And at either end of that spectrum, you are either closer to or further and more influenced by interpretation with the data sets that you've got. Thanks, and um, I just wanted to, I'm going to move back onto, uh, I guess, litigation type data, so it's going to be a bit of a jolt, but I just wanted to kind of segue by saying it's really great to see the government bodies using data in such a considerate way when, I guess you can see the other end of the spectrum in public spaces right now, like say in the US with the separated children, the government trying to use data to hide the problem yeah. and minimise, but here we have you know, massive concerted effort to see how better we can move children through the um, out-of-home system. So it's really wonderful. Um, I just want to say, um, uh, one, just to sort of go back to the points that um, Matthew was making, uh, yeah, one of the trends that we can see is moving towards predictive analytics with things like tracking litigation activity and you know, digital decisions and things like that. So moving beyond the descriptive um, to predictive, you know, if possible. And so, you know, uh, outfits like Little Metrics, for example, that are out there, um, you know, um, having actually um, what looks like a really great range of feature functionality and services for tracking litigation activity of clients and practitioners, like, you know, who's filing, when where matters are settled, and, and so on. Um, I think where, um, in terms of trend, where we maybe would like to broaden that out or take, take that, is to broaden it from, say, a single instance, like, you know, you know, who should brief me, look at their activity, to um, mapping to similar matters and more holistic tools like that. Because I think, um, you know, one of the challenges and opportunities we can see is for a practitioner to say, well, my matters like this, um, I would like to be able to, um, you know, see some analytics um, to help, say, predict an outcome or help find out who to brief. Um, based on litigation activity, but not just looking at people, but um, elements of their matter. And that I think that kind of information, that topical kind of information is 
one of our biggest challenges because we don't we haven't really been categorising it as clean or as a typical a way as you could say you know taking up a barrister's name or something like that which is, has challenges um, and um, I think one thing um, that you said earlier Matthew resonated with me was um, with the um, it sounded like you were talking about taxonomy classification with ontologies and so on I think you know at LexisNexis I think about eight years ago I completely fell in love with taxonomy and I became obsessed with it for years. Um, and that's something that we've moved through ourselves in trying to um, you know, go from, uh, I guess, traditional or old school sort of Boolean-based um, uh, application classification rules um, to use machine learning, which we've been using for a few years, um, and just seeing the trends in um, how machine learning is being used as well and how we've just got so much more available to us now. Um, there's a huge, there's just a huge portfolio of different things you can choose from for your project. Um, I think one thing that we find is that um, looking at a particular question you're trying to answer or looking at particular content that you need to work with, you don't know which um, AI solution is the right one yet. So what we, tend, we have to do really is to go with maybe two or three that we think are the most likely to help us and then kind of test them and pit them against each other. Um, so I think you know, one of the trends um, that I'm you know, really liking seeing um, is that there's just so much more available for us to use. <laughs>